Hi guys, welcome back. Uh, today we're on to our fifth episode of the series where we're going to be looking at soil and food production systems. So trying to apply the systems approach once again uh, to soil. So uh, something that's very important for overall Earth's functioning. Um, so to start with, what is soil? Well, soil is a very complex ecosystem where plants grow, animals eat, um, a habitat for many microorganisms, which can hold minerals and nutrients. Um, it can filter water and it stores and transfers heat. So you can already see there are a few similarities here with an ecosystem, for example. It is a habitat, there's stores and transfers. Um, these are components of a system and it can be considered also a non-renewable resource. So non-renewable meaning that it takes a long time to replenish and therefore uh, it's hard to use at a sustainable rate. So this should give you a little bit of an overview on kind of the, the interesting resource and the interesting system that soil is. And there are, there's a variety of approaches to take when looking at soil in more detail. So what we have here is a diagram of what can be considered the five key spheres on Earth, beginning with biosphere or living things, which is what we went over in topic two, the hydrosphere, so the water cycle, what we talked about in the last episode, and now we're gonna to come to the pedosphere, so soil systems. The two remaining are atmosphere, which we will be looking at next week, and lithosphere, which concerns rock cycles, which we don't look at in the ESS syllabus, but is equally as interesting and important. So you can see that we're applying the systems approach to four of these five spheres. Um, so what are some transfers and transformations in soil then, since we are applying it, the systems approach here, and it is an open system, what are the transfers and transformations? Well, the transfers in terms of inputs are organic and parent material, precipitation, um, infiltration through the soil layers, and energy as well. The outputs include leaching, so when minerals or water are leached out of the soil, uptake of nutrients by plants as well, and mass movement. In terms of transformations, we have decomposition, weathering, and nutrient cycling, including carbon and nitrogen cycles. So again, because of the transfers and transformations going on, we can conclude that it is an open system. And this is what a soil profile looks like. The IB want you to be familiar with the different layers and be aware of how they change through the layers, starting with the bedrock, moving to the parent material, subsoil, alluviated horizon, and then the topsoil. Um, and just by looking at this image, you can see how the consistency and what's going on in each of these layers is vastly different. Um, so now let's move on to soil texture. Now, soil is composed of four main components, mineral particles, organic remains, water, and air. Um, so the mineral particles are mainly from underlying rocks. Organic remains come from dead plants, mainly. Uh, and then water and air in the spaces between the pores. Um, and on the right here, I have a, what's known as a, a triangle about soil composition. And the IB want you to be able to read off what exactly the consistency of a sample of soil would be. And you can see on the left, we have percent clay, at the bottom percent sand, and on the right percent silt. And you literally just read it off with a ruler like that. Um, and in this diagram, you can already see in the center something called loam. And right before I went to my exams, I remember the first, the one thing I wanted to remember is that loam is good. Um, and what do I mean by that? Well, let's discuss. So on the left here, I have a diagram showing you the different sizes of particles, depending whether you have sand or clay uh, particles of soil. So you can see that the sand is much larger than the clay. What that means is when you have a large proportion of these particles together on the diagram on the right, you can see that clay particles are much more compact together and there's much less space between particles. Sand, on the other hand, there is a lot of space between particles because they can't be as compact together in the same way. So what are the implications? Well, it means that sand compared to clay has much more free drainage of water in between the pores because of these large spaces due to the large pores. 
Um, clay, on the other hand, has restricted drainage. So as we will see in a second, both of them have weaknesses because of their features. So what are the implications then for primary productivity? Let's remind ourselves that primary productivity is the rate at which energy is created by autotrophs, by the first trophic level, via photosynthesis. Um, well, it's dependent on a few factors. It's dependent on mineral content, drainage of water, uh, in contrast, water holding capacity, the spaces between the pores, the biota, so the living things, and the potential to hold organic matter. So thinking about the different sizes of the particles, have a think, and pause the video if you want, about which would be best uh, for all of these different features. Well, um, the answer is it's a mixture of the two extremes. So sand, as we went over, has very large pore size, uh, which leads to a lot of water filtering through filtering through very quickly and basically leaching out all of the nutrients. So there's no potential to hold any water at all um, and very little plant growth as a consequence, which renders the productivity very, very low. Clay, on the other hand, has the opposite problem. So the pores are way too small to allow any drainage. So there's too much retention of water. Um, However, it's too small for any um, biota to live there. And, that in the, and in that way, the productivity is limited. So what we need instead is loam, the perfect balance, um, which has a mixture of sand and clay particles. So it makes use of the water retention capacity of clay particles, but also because it has some larger particles, allows for air spaces for biota to establish itself. Um, and this leads to the highest available productivity. So now I want to move a little bit away from soil to talk about food production systems. And the first thing that the IB do in this section of the topic, and that I'd like to do as well, is to distinguish a few terms, starting with extensive versus intensive farming. So extensive is low inputs, low outputs, whereas, whereas intensive is more concentrated, high inputs, high outputs type of farming. The distinction between pastoral and arable is that pastoral is raising animals on lands that aren't really suited for uh, crops, whereas arable is growing crops on uh, land. So it's difference between animals and crops. Um, and again, for feed. And then finally, the distinction between subsistence farming and commercial farming, they're kind of related to extensive versus intensive, is that subsistence farming is um, basically enough just for to feed your family. So um, usually based on polyculture, so using lots of different crops so as to not uh, deplenish the soil of nutrients. Uh, whereas commercial farming is farming for profit. So very intensive monoculture where you just crop one type of crop um, and large scale as well. Um, and the main message when it comes to food production systems is that there is enough food, but an imbalance in how it is distributed. And there's also an issue where culturally, so cultural factors that influence our decisions uh, when it comes to harvest of food, lead to a, a large um, type of harvesting from higher trophic levels. Um, and if you remember from topic two, um, there's very inefficient transfer of energy between trophic levels, which means by the time you get to our trophic level, as you can see in this diagram, we've already lost a lot of energy in between those previous trophic levels, as there's 90% energy loss between them. And I want to briefly mention something about aquatic food production systems, which is interesting because most food comes from higher trophic levels, so minimum fourth or higher. Um, and although uh, the conversions between trophic levels is more efficient in uh, water systems, the initial intake of energy is lower because of absorption and reflection of, reflection of solar energy by water. So uh, aquatic food production systems are interesting to consider because of those two aspects. And the final thing I want to tell you guys about is how we can increase sustainability of food production systems. 
Um, and hopefully you can see that eating at lower trophic levels, so reducing meat consumption uh, and increasing consumption of locally grown food would increase sustainability. Also improving labeling, so allowing consumers to make more informed choices about where their food is coming from and what is in it. And then at a higher level, monitoring and controlling practices by um, national and multinational food corporations. Um, so these are ways that we can increase sustainability. So that concludes episode five, uh, but go ahead and click on episode six to hear about the atmosphere as a system. Um, and as always, guys, make sure to check out our website to learn how I and others could become your tutor as well.